It was a calm, clear afternoon on September 26, 2025, near Battleground, Washington, a Cessna 172F tail number November 8219. Uniform flown by 76-year-old Kenneth Schaffer of Trout Lake entered the pattern at Goheen Field, a quiet turf strip surrounded by trees. Moments later, witnesses heard the engine roaring, then silence. The airplane hit the trees and burned, killing Schaffer instantly. Now the NTSB's preliminary report is out. It doesn't solve the mystery, but it does reveal the first solid clues. So in this early analysis, let's walk through what we know, what might have gone wrong, and what pilots can learn not to judge, but to understand. Let's start with the basics, the human and the machine. Kenneth Schaffer, 76, was the registered owner of a 1964 Cessna 172F, a simple, reliable airplane most of us know well. That day, he took off from Kelso Airport, flew southeast along the Columbia River, then turned north toward Goheen Field. It was an ideal day for flying clear skies, 10 miles of visibility, calm winds. So weather's not in question here. ADSB data and local witnesses suggest this wasn't an emergency or diversion. It looked like a casual local flight, maybe some pattern work. But Goheen Field is no easy playground. It's a 25-65 foot turf strip short and uneven lined with trees and power lines on both ends. For an older pilot or anyone not current there, that's a field that demands precision. Even a small mistake in altitude or energy management can close the gap between control and catastrophe very fast. The ADSB data gives us a surprisingly clear picture. Schaffer approached from the northeast, entered a left-hand pattern for runway 15, and performed a touch-and-go around 1.03 p.m. That first circuit looked fine downwind at roughly 1,400 feet MSL turning base and final smoothly touching down near the last third of the runway. Nothing unusual. But right after liftoff, things started to drift. Instead of climbing back to pattern altitude, the airplane stayed low around 200 feet MSL through the crosswind and early downwind. That's really low, especially over trees. About a minute later, it finally climbed to about 900 feet MSL, then turned left onto base, but this time drifted slightly west of centerline, showing a bit of overshoot. Seconds later, the trace ends as the airplane descended through 300 feet MSL, roughly 120 feet northwest of the runway threshold. Witnesses filled in the rest. They said the engine sounded strong, full power, but the airplane came in fast on final. Then it banked sharply and disappeared behind the trees. So by the numbers, it looks like a routine pattern that got just a little too low, a little too tight, and a little too fast, a combination that leaves almost no room for correction once something slips. Now let's move to what the wreckage actually tells us, because sometimes the story is written right there in the metal. The first point of impact was about 75 feet up a large tree, and that alone says a lot. At that height, the airplane wasn't in a full descent. It was still climbing or banking when it hit. That impact ripped off about a four-foot section of the right wing and aileron and investigators later found wood fibers embedded in the aluminum skin, showing that it struck the tree with serious force while still under power. The propeller blades were twisted and bent backward in that familiar S shape, and the leading edges were polished smooth. That's a textbook indicator of power on impact, meaning the engine was running probably at high RPM right up until the moment of collision. In other words, this wasn't an engine out or mechanical failure situation. The main wreckage ended up inverted about 138 feet south of that tree. The cabin wings and engine compartment were heavily fire damaged, and the flames reached all the way into the baggage area where an auxiliary fuel cell was mounted. That likely explains why the post-impact fire burned so hot and spread so fast. But here's a really critical detail investigators confirmed full flight control continuity. Every cable and linkage from the yoke to the control surfaces was still connected. That rules out an in-flight control failure or structural breakup. So when you piece that all together, powered impact, no pre-impact failure, and normal control linkages, it paints a very clear picture. This was a loss of control close to the ground, not a mechanical malfunction. And that's often where the most unforgiving accidents happen at low altitude, where there's just no room to recover once things start to go wrong. So if the airplane was mechanically sound, what caused it to lose control? Let's look at what the data and witness reports suggest again, not to point fingers, but to understand how small mistakes can snowball when you're close to the ground. The first thing that jumps out is altitude discipline. 
The ADS-B data shows Schaffer flying pattern legs as low as 200 feet MSL, that's barely above the treetops around Goheen. And flying that low, especially over uneven tree-lined terrain, leaves virtually no margin for recovery if something goes even slightly wrong. It's also worth noting the pattern geometry. After the first touch and go, the airplane never regained proper pattern altitude before turning again. That means Schaffer might have been trying to stay tight in the pattern, maybe to stay close to the runway or simply to keep the circuit short. But that tightness, combined with low altitude, can trap even experienced pilots in what's often called an energy management corner low, slow, and banked. Now witnesses said the airplane was coming in fast and that they heard the engine roaring at full power before impact. That suggests the pilot might have realized the approach wasn't stabilized, maybe he was high fast or overshooting final and decided to go around late. But here's the catch, if you're already low and banked when you add power, the airplane can pitch up sharply, lose coordinated lift on one wing, and stall all in a heartbeat. Even with full power, a Cessna 172 can absolutely stall if it's pulled too hard or banked too steeply. That's what's called an accelerated stall, and at just a few hundred feet above the ground, it's unrecoverable. The really scary part is that it often feels like you're doing everything right, full throttle, nose up, banking for alignment, and yet aerodynamically, the wing is already past its critical angle of attack. Another possible factor, and again we say this carefully, is age. At 76 years old, Schaffer may have had slower reaction times or reduced situational awareness, especially during a sudden upset or surprise. The NTSB will eventually review his medical records, but as of now, there's no indication of a medical event in flight. Still, it's something investigators will consider because the combination of workload visual judgment and quick corrections is demanding even for younger pilots. And finally, let's talk about the airfield itself. Goheen Field is a short turf strip surrounded by trees. Pilots often approach a bit faster there to maintain control authority over the rough surface, and that could explain why the witness said the Cessna looked fast on final. But when you combine that extra speed with a late turn or a tight pattern, it can quickly turn into a sink or overshoot situation. That's the razor's edge of pattern work. It feels routine until it's not. So what can we take away from this, keeping in mind that this is still an early analysis based on the preliminary report? Right now, the NTSB has ruled out mechanical failure and in-flight breakup, but not yet why control was lost. That's still coming in the final report. But even at this stage, there are powerful lessons hiding in the data. First, pattern work isn't harmless. It's easy to think of local circuits as casual or low risk, but the truth is, pattern flying at low altitude is one of the most unforgiving environments in general aviation. There's no altitude cushion, no escape room. Every decision, every bank angle, every speed change counts. Second, the go-around decision. This is one of those subtle but crucial skills. If the approach isn't working, if you're high fast or off alignment, the right move is to go around early. Not after you've sunk low, not when you're already turning or correcting. It's an easy thing to say, and an extremely frustrating thing to do in the moment, but it's the one decision that often saves a flight. And finally, the physics don't care. Power doesn't guarantee lift. If the wing's past its critical angle, even full throttle won't save you. That's the cruel, unchangeable rule of flight. The final NTSB report will eventually fill in the gaps we'll learn more about Schaffer's recent flying history, the aircraft's maintenance, maybe even a deeper look at the field conditions that day. Until then, what we know already reinforces a timeless truth. Even a routine flight in perfect weather demands total attention and respect for energy and altitude. Our thoughts remain with Kenneth Schaffer's family and friends. This analysis isn't about blame, it's about understanding what went wrong so others can recognize the same traps before they close in. If you want to stay updated as the final report comes out and follow how this case unfolds, make sure you're subscribed. We'll go over the full findings when they're released.